Session one titled ROK U.S. Alliance will now begin. Dr. Sumi Terry from the Center for Strategic and International Studies will be moderating the session. Dr. Terry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, hope you had good lunch. Again, I'm Sue Terry, Senior Fellow at CSIS, and I'll be moderating this panel uh, on U.S. Rock Alliance. Uh, the Alliance is now more than 70 years old, and I, yeah, I think it's fair to say that the Alliance is facing, uh, facing challenges today. Um, you know, President Moon just came back from Washington, and he barely got any quality moments uh, with President Trump. President Trump, uh, understandably, is quite distracted domestically uh, from immigration policies to dealing with fallout of the Mueller investigation and the report. Um, and President Trump and President Moon, e even though they were united last year in, in dealing with North Korea, I think it, it, there's a concern that now they may be headed in different direction. And of course, this is in the backdrop <coughs> of um, China-US uh, rivalry, as we just talked about this morning, uh, with changing uh, geostrategic landscape in Northeast Asia. So to discuss all the challenges and opportunities of the alliance and to uh, how to deal with uh, how US and South Korea can now coordinate and strengthen and preserve the alliance. We have this excellent panel. Um, and we're going to start, I think, alphabetically with um, Professor Kim Sung Han. And we'll then go with uh, Mr. Mark Knepper, Sis Seiler, and Mr. Um, Soeya Yoshihide, and Professor Su Fang. And we'll start with Professor Kim Sung Han. He's a Dean and Professor of International Relations at the Graduate School of International Studies um, at Koryo, Uni right? Koryo University. Uh, Korea University. And um, he was formerly Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade. You have his full bio. So let's start with Professor Kim. Have 10 minutes, not to exceed 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, Sumit Terry. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Asan Institute uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak to uh, distinguished experts uh, in this hall. I think uh, this is uh, uh, an alliance session uh, between Seoul and Washington. But the primary issue, of course, is the North Korea policy. So uh, let me briefly touch upon uh, the North Korea policy and then um, possible uh, Korea's role uh, in the U.S. Uh, regional strategy uh, under the heading of uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and some uh, policy recommendations for both of us. Uh, as you know, uh, <coughs> the Trump admi uh, administration uh, is uh, sticking to so-called the big deal uh, position, <coughs> excuse me, uh, while North Korea is uh, still maintaining uh, the same position uh, as in Hanoi. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, North Korea is not uh, willing to go beyond the Yongbyon uh, nuclear uh, complex uh, in return for the lifting of uh, uh, economic sanctions and is still sticking to uh, the phased or staged approach uh, rather than kind of a once and for war kind of approach. Uh, while on the other hand, the United States uh, uh, wants uh, a comprehensive deal, uh, including uh, the roadmap, a uh, com uh, comprehensive uh, roadmap and uh, CVID. Uh, this means that uh, North Korea uh, has not changed it, uh, its game plan uh, despite uh, its uh, strategic blunder uh, in Hanoi. According to uh, North Korean uh, game plan, uh, in my interpretation, uh, North Korea will continue uh, a top-down approach uh, toward the United States so that uh, President Trump uh, might be uh, alienated uh, from his uh, staff members. North Korea, secondly, will accelerate the miniaturization of uh, nuclear warheads and the development of uh, ICBMs 
uh, capable of uh, uh, hitting the mainland of the United States uh, until it can uh, trade uh, Yongbyon uh, nuclear facilities and more uh, for the lifting of uh, sanctions and more. Certainly, North Korea will prevent the United States uh, from imposing the verifiable uh, declaration of uh, nuclear programs on North Korea uh, by taking uh, self-initiated uh, kind of uh, measures of uh, uh, denuclearization uh, rather than declaring kind of a comprehensive uh, uh, list of uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear capabilities. Fourth, North Korea will cooperate with uh, South Korea uh, to, to make it uh, play uh, as a kind of a strategic shield against uh, possible uh, U.S. Uh, uh, military threat uh, to, to, to use force. And finally, uh, North Korea will have uh, President Trump uh, you know, uh, withdraw or, or at least uh, significantly reduce uh, USFK in, in return for uh, North Korea's uh, apparently uh, complete but uh, partial uh, denuclearization, if I may. However, the United States uh, does not seem to be in a hurry to respond to this kind of a game plan. Uh, President Trump has realized uh, economic sanctions are working, and he has been uh, relieved uh, from the political and legal pressure uh, from the uh, Robert Mueller uh, Special uh, Counsel. Uh, this means uh, he may be able to uh, concentrate on uh, domestic issues uh, for his uh, re-election rather than uh, foreign policy issues uh, that have been uh, less effective uh, in light of uh, previous uh, you know, presidential elections of the United States. Another repercussion of Hanoi uh, is that it has become extremely uh, difficult uh, for, for President Moon Jae-in's so-called uh, good enough uh, deal uh, to be accepted by President Trump uh, because uh, finding a kind of a midpoint uh, between small deal uh, and a big deal uh, is now be, being seen by Washington uh, as being closer uh, to the small deal uh, rather than uh, to the big deal. Against this backdrop, uh, it is imperative uh, that uh, President Moon uh, should uh, persuade uh, Kim Jong-un to agree on the roadmap for uh, denuclearization uh, with the condition that uh, the stage uh, denuclearization uh, will be uh, implemented. Uh, but it should be noted that uh, more than 70% uh, of uh, verifiable denuclearization uh, should be concentrated in the first stage, and the following kind of a, a complete denuclearization diplomatic normalization and uh, the peace uh, regime building kind of things uh, should be done uh, in the second and the third stages. In other words, core, hardcore measures of uh, denuclearization should be made in early uh, stages so that uh, North Korea's so-called salami tactics uh, may not be working and the denuclearization uh, may become uh, irreversible. So I think in this sense, uh, ROK, U.S., U.S. ROK uh, bilateral working group uh, may explore this kind of option uh, to uh, narrow the gap. Another subject is uh, South Korea's uh, role in the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, if you read uh, the national security strategy of the United States and other official documents, uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, is anchored upon uh, so-called Quad, uh, that consists of uh, U.S., uh, Japan, Australia, and, and India, but it seems it is rather, you know, anchored upon, you know, it is rather, you know, stag uh, stagnant uh, due to the extremely uh, ambiguous position of India, if I may. Nevertheless, uh, there is no reason for ROK to hesitate uh, to support the, ba the basic principles and the vision of the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, such as uh, free flow of uh, uh, trade, uh, respect of uh, sovereignty, you know, FON, freedom of navigation, uh, access to uh, global commons, uh, et cetera. Uh, as the country who has the intellectual property rights uh, for FOIP, uh, free and open uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, Japan 
I think, is now well poised to uh, participate in BRI, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, by improving its uh, uh, economic relationship with China at the moment. Uh, this means that uh, FOIP uh, as well as uh, BRI are not uh, incompatible with each other. A uh, more serious uh, problem, though, on the part of South Korea is that uh, South Korea is uh, preoccupied with North Korea and spends little time on its uh, Japan and uh, China relations, uh, let alone uh, its uh, regional strategy in, in uh, East Asia uh, or uh, Indo-Pacific, if I may. My last point, briefly, is that it requires, it requires a mutual, not unilateral effort mutual efforts for the ROK-US alliance uh, to become uh, sustainable uh, and to de develop uh, for the future. Uh, as an ally of the United States, uh, ROK uh, needs to avoid the role of a kind of a mediator uh, between North Korea and the United States, as if uh, you know, South Korea is neither an ally nor a you know, responsible stakeholder of the uh, North Korean uh, question. On the part of the United States, uh, it should avoid kind of a transactional approach uh, to uh, alliances uh, so that uh, South Korean uh, people uh, may feel more pride and dignity uh, out of its uh, alliance relationship uh, with the United States. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Mark Knepper, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Korea, Japan, East Asia. Uh, Department of State. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Sumi, and uh, thanks, Asan, for uh, for putting this together, for inviting me. It's nice to be back in Seoul, but it's also really nice, uh, I think, to be on this side instead of that side, where I was usually sitting when I was here in uh, in the ROK before. But um, also especially grateful to have Sid Seiler on this panel with me. I think with strength in numbers today, we can respond to virtually any question or issue that that comes up. Right, Sid. Right. Okay, um, so knowing well that, that we were going to leap right into uh, issues related to U.S. ROK coordination on North Korea, um, I also wanted to open the aperture just a little bit uh, on the U.S.-Korea alliance, um, recognizing fully well that it is an alliance that's based upon our security relationship dating back to the Korean War, but but also I think uh, we'd be giving our relationship, our alliance, short shrift if we didn't also discuss some of the many other things um, that we do together as friends, partners, and allies. Uh, we heard already from uh, Professor Kim about the free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, and, and I appreciate his raising that because I'll get to that in a little bit, but I think really when we look at our alliance, of course, as I said, it is based very much on our defense relationship, uh, based upon our, our shared goal of deterring and defending, if need be, against North Korean aggression. I know this is something that Sid will get into more in his remarks. Um, but on the issue of, of the US and South Korea not being on the same page, that somehow we're, we're drifting apart, uh, let me just say that uh, you know, I, I strongly disagree. Because if you look at the amount of coordination that has gone into our respective uh, policies, it has gone into ensuring that our policies are on the same page, really. Uh, with between Seoul and Washington, it's it's a daily effort. We are in daily contact at every level, virtually, uh, between uh, between the White House and the Blue House, between the State Department and the Wegyobu, between the Pentagon and Gupangu here. I mean, it's 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 really something uh, to see. And if you look uh, in the sort of weeks after Hanoi, what you'll see is in quick succession, uh, we had Foreign Minister Kang met with Secretary Pompeo. You had Defense Minister Jung met with. Uh, Acting Defense Secretary Shanahan, and of course we had President Moon meet with uh, meet with President Trump. And if that's not coordination, I don't know what is. And so we've we've stayed in very close touch. Uh, we have this very high level uh, engagement, but then of course we have the more regular meetings, the working group, which which Dr. Kim mentioned, uh, the USROK working group on North Korea policy uh, is engaged regularly, either directly in person or by video conference, to ensure that. Um, that we're on the same page when it comes to things like inter-Korean relations, US DPRK relations, uh, and other areas. And so, uh, by necessity, yes, I mean, North Korea occupies a huge part of our bilateral engagement, but it's not the only part. And this, this conference is about 
Korea's choice, right? And, and we in Korea made a choice several years ago to take our bilateral relationship, to take our alliance uh, to the next level, meaning that it, it had to be about more than just uh, the Korean Peninsula. There had to be more about you know, reflecting the intense trade and investment relationship that was, that was developing uh, to reflect the fact that Korea as the world's 11th largest economy had a legitimate and welcome role to play both regionally and on the world stage. And that really the people-to-people the -people relations between our two countries that provides the ballast for our ties uh, is another area of, of soft power that we needed to better uh, take advantage of, to better leverage in, in all the areas, other areas of our, our bilateral pursuits. So if you look at, for example, the economic aspects of our alliance, really, I mean, it comes down to economic security, a, an oft, unfortunately, undiscussed, unheralded part of our two countries' alliance, but one that is, is absolutely critical to the prosperity of both of our peoples. So with that in mind, we, of course, we, we signed uh, the, the Chorus FDA uh, several years ago. We amended it. Uh, last year, it was ratified by the Korean National Assembly last December, and it's uh, really been an effective means to, to further uh, lash up our two economies, to further lash up our two peoples. So now we've got the United States. Uh, out of deference to, to the EU, actually the United States is the largest investor in, uh, in Korea. Uh, Korea is one of the largest growing investors in the United States. In fact, uh, on May 9th, we're having a ribbon cutting for uh, Lotes opening a huge petrochemical plant in, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. $3 billion, 3,000 American jobs, good jobs, uh, and, and you know, further proof that really this, our two economies are becoming increasingly interdependent. Uh, I think in terms of economic security, we also have to talk about energy security. And this is, some, this is a, one of the fastest growing parts of our two countries' relationship, part of our alliance. Uh, Korea is the largest importer of LNG from the United States. It's one of the largest importers of petroleum. And this is going to continue to grow. And thanks to this energy relationship, the trade deficit between the United States and South Korea has declined by 60% over the past couple of years. A hugely significant, and again, I think unsung aspect of our two countries' commitment to security in the broadest sense, economic security, energy security. And I think uh, another area that requires focus, and again, can be an, easy, an easily uh, uh, sort of understood part of our alliance, is what, what can the US and South Korea do when it comes to setting global standards? Things like 5G, AI, um, automated vehicles, nanotechnology, all of the aspects, all of the things that go into the fourth industrial revolution are all areas that the US and the ROK as leading uh, industrial powers, as leading technological powers, are absolutely uh, well positioned to work together on, not just in the furtherance of uh, global standards and global standards of transparency and openness, but also standards that can help bring our two countries closer together. Um, just pivoting really quickly to, uh, to the free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, we're very excited about, about Korea's own uh, new southern policy. This is President Moon's, one of his signature policies. Uh, and we think there's absolutely uh, room for, for overlap, for coordination between our two countries in this area. Uh, whether it's, it's developing energy infrastructure in Southeast Asia and South Asia, uh, whether it's uh, promoting uh, maritime domain awareness among the Pacific Islands, whether it's uh, working on bridging the digital divide, whether it's on uh, promoting women's empowerment, gender equality, these are all areas that are part and parcel to our free and open Indo-Pacific and absolutely are a good fit, a perfect fit for Korea's own new Southern policy. So I absolutely agree, uh, not just with Dr. Kim, but what we heard earlier from Che Gong, that it's it completely appropriate and frankly welcome for, for Korea to be a part of, of this effort for the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, I'll stop there. It's probably close to 10 minutes. So turn it over to Sid. No, Sid, okay. well, I want to introduce you quickly. Sid is USFK Command Senior Analyst, my former colleague uh, of the agency days, also a former US Special Envoy for Six Party Talks and Director of the National Security Council. Sumi, thank you, and thanks to Asan for this uh, wonderful plenum like it always is and this opportunity to speak on an important I issue. I think. Given the importance of the U.S. ROK relationship right now, I, I don't mind being a little bit uh, redundant in, in foot stomping some of uh, Mark's detailed uh, uh, kind of lay down of the, of the solid, uh, enduring, multi-dimensional, healthy, 
aspects of the relationship. Over here is uh, General Lee So Young, who was the defense attache in Washington when I was at the National Security Council. And we marked the 60th anniversary of the alliance, and there were a lot of, lot of uh, events that year uh, that were really designed to kind of uh, reflect on 60 years since uh, the victory in the Korean War, as President Obama declared it, in terms of everything that is, re is reflected in the Republic of Korea in stark contrast to the darkness of North Korea. And it was also a year that, you know, we were facing uh, p political change here. There was an election in the Republic of Korea, and we were looking at uh, who were the three p potential uh, candidates at that time and how we would transition the U.S.-ROK relationship. And, and, you know, there were a few points that we always wove into our talking points and that were, that were crucial to the foundations of the relationship. First of, it, first of all, that the relationship was a relationship among equals. This was not 1953, this was not 1960s, 1970s, 1980s developmental Korea. This is two uh, powers with shared interests, shared values, who taught each other, who, who, who treated each other with respect and pursued shared interests, both in issues related directly to the peninsula and those in the surrounding areas. Second, it was an alliance that was more than about North Korea. It is unfortunate that most of the headline grabbing news is related to North Korea. And it's also unfortunate that as an extension of North Korea's own propaganda efforts that are, that are seeking primarily to drive a wedge in the relationship, how much of that nonsense actually drives the headlines? When, as Mark mentioned, for example, just in that brief snippet on the amount of collaboration and cooperation and consultation and talks and letters and meetings uh, that followed just the Hanoi summit, it is a gross over-exaggeration to suggest that we're not aligned or we're not talking or we're pursuing different, different paths. Uh, it is a, it is a alliance that we knew would need to transcend partisan politics and ideologies, that it could survive whatever winds were blowing in Washington and whatever winds were blowing in Seoul, so that it was not conservatives in, in the United States and conservatives in in the Republic of Korea that kept the alliance together, but greater, uh, more deeper, profound, shared interests and shared commitments uh, to the relationship. And then finally, you know, as I look at that year, it was also not too long after the collapse of the, uh, the Leap Day understanding, and another uh, deal where we had painted a bright future for, for North Korea if they chose the correct path, and as they have repeatedly, they failed to choose the correct path. Uh, you know, it was a, a deliberate decision to not allow uh, the USROK relationship to become a victim or to be sacrificed in the pursuit of, of uh, deals or diplomacy with North Korea. I used to like to say that analytically, we always face this question, then it was, what happens if it, if U.S. DPRK relations get too far out ahead of inter-Korean relations as we were pursuing the diplomacy in 2011 and 2012 uh, that led to the Leap Day Agreement. And here we are today almost with the exact opposite question, right? What happens if inter-Korean relations? And I, I would say that analytically speaking, I cannot imagine North Korea that is engaged in serious denuclearization talks that is not dealing respectfully in pursuit of true detente, true rapprochement on the Korean Peninsula. And I cannot conceive of a North Korea that is engaged in sincere pursuit of inter-Korean rapprochement and detente that is not also showing commitment on denuclearization. There can be false progress on one or the other, but it will not sustain itself. So I worry less about that uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, <coughs> I think these two issues are inseparable anyways. Who would want a better relationship with a North Korea that mm. isn't denuclearizing, that you know one day will use their nuclear capability in a coercive manner? And what type of denuclearization deal could we have confidence in with a North Korea that keeps threatening their southern brethren? Let me pivot then to the alliance. This is where I find myself. I've had an interesting career, 37 years working on North Korea, 
at just about every level you can imagine, and intel to intel, mill to mill, working at the White House, working uh, at the, uh, the State Department, and even having the unusual uh, opportunity to, to interpret for Paul Wolfowitz during a visit of the, uh, the Iraq foreign minister many years back under the Bush administration. But uh, yeah, I find myself with U.S. Forces Korea now, and you know, U.S. Forces Korea, Combined Forces Command, United Nations Commands are the three, the three, the three commands that we uh, organize into to deal with the North Korea threat, the United Nations Command, primarily being engaged in ensuring enforcement of the armistice uh, and being uh, the focal point for the integration of, of international commitments in times of contingency. U.S. Forces Korea, the, the, with our 28,500 plus or minus some here or there troops with their families showing the United States commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea and Combined Forces Command, of course, where we sit side by side with our ROK colleagues on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, ensuring deterrence, sending assurance, and, and hoping to provide the, uh, uh, an environment conducive to a diplomatic solution to this issue. I think, you know, in, in, in addition to all the, the uh, various meetings and calls that Mark mentioned post Hanoi, the fact that you have a, a four-star command, we have the deputy commander here from our ROK side, two four-stars sitting side by side, talking day to day about how to ensure deterrence and deter North Korea uh, from provocations and aggression. Uh, three stars, two stars, one stars, too many to count. Uh, day to day, sitting side by side, uh, maintaining readiness. We recently concluded uh, a Dongmeng exercise, which was an excellent opportunity for us to uh, when you have this complex uh, relationship like we do with two countries' armies sitting side by side, exercising command and control functions, exercising critical uh, decision points, exercising mission, mission essential tasks, uh, Dongmeng proved once again how solid the, the alliance is, how prepared we are for whatever North Korea brings at us if they come to the table. Uh, with a, a, a sincere attitude towards dialogue. We are there scaling uh, our, our military posture, scaling our exercises to enable the, di the, the diplomats to carry out their work. And as well, we, ca well, we carry out deterrence on a day-by-day -day basis, we're also there ready to respond if need be. Uh, you know, the, the fact that we are able to adjust the scale and scope and timing and even volume of our exercises to enable diplomacy to work while at the same time ensure appropriate strong levels of readiness to, to uh, maintain deterrence has been one of, the, I think, the uh, success messages of, of 2018. I remember being asked one time, you know, under what conditions uh, is, it, is it advisable to, to engage in in negotiations with North Korea, like what 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 should your prerequisites be? And and I think it's clear that our policy now is that we would pursue a, a, a policy policy of both engagement and pressure. It's pressure that's led to the behavioral change on North Korea's part. It's likely pressure that will bring them across the goal line to some degree. Uh, but also, it's it's maintaining that that military readiness because as bad as this program grows and as much as North Korea may be advancing, uh, the key thing is we sit here in a very beautiful hotel, a very robust city with a dynamic e economy. People go to, night at, go to bed at night resting assured that the security of the Republic of Korea is in the hands of military professionals from their own country, the Republic of Korea, and the United States, and that is uh, no small accomplishment. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, this is a a hyper media environment through which to view the state of the U.S. ROK relationship, uh, and commentators across the ideological spectrum have a variety of motivations for characterizing uh, the relationship, far beyond what their uh, what the actual you know, nature of what we do and how we do it, why those ties are so strong, why they're so enduring. 
uh, and, and I know that, uh, it, you know, working this now at its most fundamental level, in the day-to-day, mill-to-mill relationship, the alliance is strong, and I'm, I'm very optimistic about our ability to handle whatever's thrown at us going forward. Thank you. Uh, we have now Mr. Uh, Professor Soya Yoshihide. Um, he's a professor of political science and international relations in the Faculty of Law at Keio University. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, I, I would also like to thank Asan Institute for re-inviting me here. And it's, it's like uh, meeting old friends you know, mm-hmm. each year and it's such a precious uh, occasion. And uh, I also would like to thank the planners of this uh, uh, panel to include Japan, particularly on the subject of ROK-US alliance, because I really believe Japan is pretty much part of the ROK-US uh, alliance framework. Uh, if you just remember the uh, recent history, uh, U.S.-Japan alliance, I mean, security treaty was signed in 1951, which was just in the middle of the Korean War. And American troops, uh, you know, came to the peninsula to save South Korea, came from Japan uh, uh, during those years. And most of the military contingent of this alliance uh, arrangements uh, stationed in Japan were originally primarily looking at the Korean peninsula, uh, security of the Korean peninsula. And uh, you don't need Marines to defend yourself. And Marines in Okinawa were looking at the Korean Peninsula for most of the time. Uh, recently, of course, they are being deployed everywhere. And uh, so from the, the deep origin of our two alliances, I think uh, Japan and South Korea were a unit, uh, particularly from American uh, military perspective. And I think even today, uh, if looked from the American perspective, uh, military alliance with Japan and the military alliance with South Korea are the set, a unit, uh, pretty much. And lack of appreciation of this very critical fundamental point in both Japan and South Korea, maybe m- more so in South Korea, if I may, I think is, is really something to be, I don't know, repented or whatever. And so from, from this point of view, I'd like to uh, talk about the ROK US alliance uh, in terms of North Korea, pretty much along the line of uh, Kim Song Han's uh, presentation, uh, North Korea and uh, Indo Pacific uh, versus uh, R- uh, BRI. And uh, as to North Korea, uh, I've been arguing this, I'm, I'm a definite minority in Japan. Uh, from the very beginning, I've been arguing that Mr. Kim Jong un is very serious in his own way about what he has, you know, trying to do. And I think the critical thing for us to discuss, debate, is the nature of his seriousness. And, but the dominant arguments and percep- perceptions in Japan, and maybe in the United States as well, if not in South Korea necessarily, is nothing new from North Korea initiatives and if we get along with them, we'll eventually be deceived again, and uh, you know they're, they're going to win, you know this this uh, game. And I think we sh- it's high time, after looking at three summits between uh, two summits between North Korea and the U.S., I think it's high time for us to come to realize that he's he's serious. So the the key po- key issue is how and in what way he's serious, and th- this is very much debatable. And uh, so I, I don't have any answer to this myself, uh, but emphasizing this point that is important for us to get into the real sort of, you know, uh, meaningful process of dealing with North Korea uh, for a long time to come. I, I, I'm sure Mr. Kim Jong has maybe 20, 30, 40 years in his mind. And uh, of course, it's not guaranteed, but he has time. And. Uh, and so after this, uh, you know, two failed summits, uh, first one could not be called uh, failed necessarily, but uh, he's still, r- I think, remaining on the same track. And, uh, and so he's trying many things and going to even to go- going to Vladivostok. And uh, so in order for this process to get really started, 
I think this is my personal view. Uh, many, many may disagree. I think we have to deal with them on the basis of uh, Kim Jong Un's uh, interest in kind of so-called phased process. And as long as we put the entire nuclear disarmament at the entrance, perhaps nothing serious would move. But uh, agreeing to this formula process does not necessarily, of course, mean that we'll, we'll you know, just, uh, just buy him. And so this process is going to be a long term and a very complex process. And there should really be a coordinated strategy among ourselves uh, to start with US, Korea. And, uh, and, and the, my sense is if we get into this process, there may come a time at a certain point that Mr. Kim Jong un may find himself in a, in a situation uh, whereby moving forward would be somewhat tricky, risky, but moving backward is also disastrous. And uh, then I think a real, real kind of negotiation, real dealing with him will start from there. And uh, so this is my personal fantasy, but uh, I think mm -hmm. uh, so we should get into this process. And uh, that's pre uh, precisely because I think Mr. Kim Jong is serious in his own way. And, uh, but this is not a place to, to discuss what, what uh, should be meant by this, but uh, that's my general kind of uh, view about a North Korean thing. And uh, if this is the case, I mean, US Korea should be on the same sort of you know, conceptual and strategic thinking. And uh, right now, again, if I may, uh, Mike, this is impression, impressionistic observation, but uh, uh, in, in the current uh, government in, in China, uh, there, there seems to be a tendency to look at the US as an obstacle to the process that they would like to move. And they would equally look at Japan as an obstacle. And I think this assumption should, should be gone in one way or another. Uh, uh, South Korea should work with the US and work with Japan uh, in order to move things forward, in order for South Korea to remain relevant and meaningful in this process of talking to uh, North Korea. And, uh, and if I may get back to Indo-Pacific and BRI, I think now things are moving in the direction uh, whereby policymakers in regional countries are feeling a little more comfortable in, think, in trying to find some common grounds between these somewhat geopolitical you know, concepts, and uh, in, in including Japan, if I may. Uh, our government stopped using the term strategy. US is still using uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, but Japan officially stopped using the term strategy. And uh, the reason being, this would imply it's kind of so-called so anti-China strategy. And as long as this concept is regarded as explicitly anti-China, I think form a, forming a coalition among regional countries about this w would not be easy. I don't think Korea would be comfortable, and the Southeast Asian countries are also not very comfortable in looking at this as something uh, terribly anti-China. And I think this is a ref reflection of the improvement of Sino-Japanese relations, of course. And uh, so they are now using the term uh, vision. And, and along the line of that, uh, now Beijing and Tokyo are talking about, I think, common grounds between BRI and uh, Indo-Pacific. And even a joint ODA sort of project between Japan and China in third countries. Of course, things are not easy, but the fact that this has been discussed, I think, is, is very, very, very much interesting. And so finding a common ground between RIB and the uh, Indo-Pacific, this is largely in the field of economics, uh, I'm afraid, not in the traditional security domain. So, so Indo-Pacific may have two phases, they are simply stated, you know, so geopolitical dimension as well as economic dimension. And in this economic dimension, I think there is no reason that Korea cannot be part of it. And if I may interpret what Mr. Steinberg said in the opening address, uh, Korea, you know, having four op options, siding with the U.S., siding with China, and then becoming neutral, and three of them may not, may not work. The fourth option being some kind of intermediary role, uh, be you know, between U.S. and China. And if, if, if I uh, put it in a larger context, uh, this virtually should mean 
Korea playing some important role uh, in working with both RIB and uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, where U.S. is, of course, critical, and Japan is also very much interested in, and, uh, and also uh, BRI, and it's virt virtually working with China. And uh, Japan has already started to do this, and uh, I think this is, this is the kind of, you know, the meaning of uh, Japan uh, becoming somewhat accommodative to Chinese BRI initiatives. This is not to mean that uh, buying everything, of course, but I think the intention is to, again, find finding a sort of common grounds between these two. And this is, in a way, a way to accommodate the rise of China in a regional context. And, uh, and uh, I don't know what sort of order would emerge in the future, but one way of thinking is something of a hybrid, nature of a hybrid, might might eventually emerge. So it's not either you know engaging China in a liberal order, or it's not uh, about being absorbed uh, you know by the Chinese sphere of influence. And so in that sense, this is really a new game, I think. And in a way, consciously or unconsciously, regional countries, it seems to me, is moving in that direction in talking to each other and working out some common approaches. And I really, really hope. South Korea would become part of this. And I really, really hope that South Korea would take ROK-US alliance in a broader sense, uh, the important sort of you know, reference point in, in moving in this direction. And uh, if, if they begin to do this, I think the same could be said about Japan. And uh, let me finish by talking about ROK-Japan, if I may. Uh, of course, things are really awful. and. And the South Korean government at this moment would like to uh, define the f fundamental nature of our relationship from the point of view of justice and from the point of view of historical justice. And the issue of justice is okay, this is important. But uh, there are tons of reasons why Japan and South Korea should cooperate along the line of uh, the point that I wanted to make. And uh, so these issues, difficult issues, are important precisely because this is an obstacle to our cooperation. So, so why we have to cooperate and how should come first, and then address difficult issues as an associated issue. But now it seems to me that cu current Korean government's priorities are upside down. I think that's why the relationship is difficult. So I'll finish. Yeah. Thank you. So last speaker, Professor Xiu <coughs> Feng, he's the executive director of the China Center uh, for Collaborative Studies of the South China Sea at Nanjing University. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Tammy. So first of all, let me express my deep thanks to our Science Institute from the beginning uh, inauguration of this, for, uh, this forum. I remember I almost attract the all every year's you know, forum. So every time I hear, so it's a big um, benefit to me. Um, my view uh, on the China, uh, on the U.S. ROK alarms, probably among Chinese, a little bit bizarre. The reason is, I see in the past four decades, then we will see China's uh, economic and uh, social development just to happen in a parallel with such alarms. The feasibility and liability of alarm is also anchored some sort of we say, peace and the security in Korean Peninsula, particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, China and the Russia way also left the North Korea long. Then we will see such an ally actually anchor the stability of the uh, Korean Peninsula. So then if we just have a very quick examination of the past four decades, how China in peace with such an alliance, conclusion, will be very positive. So on the other hand, we will see such alarms are still a big source of the future stabilizer in the Korean Peninsula. We don't know how the nuclear DPRK could be settled on, or there will be some sort of accidental, accidental nuclear explosion, or there will be futures very disastrous uh, radiation of some sort of such a, a nuclear uh, we say uh, incidental, just explosion, or such a scenario could not be just excluded. But with the alarms always on the track, then it's also a bigger reference. Chinese kid just has to say very safely and also very trustably just to refer to. 
because any such uh, with a nuclear incident happening, then we will see two powers will be more experienced than any players in the region. One is U.S., other is Japan. So then such an alliance could, pr of course, is very likely ensure some sort of a multilateral endorsement to let any nuclear crisis you know, approaching if it happen. Um, another one, uh, I think the positive aspect of the alliance I can figure out is uh, we will see how successful China's uh, we say neighborhood diplomacy could go. I think it is based on two things. One is China's open market, and the China's development could just uh, how say become some, some sort of a leading source of economic prosperity. The other is whether the China's reascent, the coziness of our neighbors could also just uh, how say um, dramatically increasing. Their comfort is a very important insurance to how successful China's neighborhood diplomacy could be. Without this, then we will see, yes, that China's neighborhood diplomacy probably will running a lot of difficulties. So then I see such a, a presumption is truly not working between US, China, and the ROK. So then I see the ROK's role is not just a mitigator between the US and China, ROK is also, I think, uh, in my turn, is a great anchor between uh, some sort of a potential of a, a great power competition. Two examples, one is get back to the 2016, when the China and US getting into a very, very uh, hot debate on how the South China Sea stability could be handled. U.S. also just very forcefully call on China for uh, rule-based orders. Then we will see Seoul said nothing about forcing the China to abide by the uh, Hager uh, Tribunal ruling. Then another one is the foreign apps. I think my friend uh, Dr. Chong also mentioned it. Then we will see the Seoul almost keep very, very muted about the foreign apps. But you know, the last uh, septem September, there was a uh, uh, South Korean warship intruded into the uh, near water of the uh, uh, Palazzo Island. It got me very, very upset. I said, oh, the ROK want just to break the uh, rule of the game and just join the US for foreign apps. But at the end, we see it is not. So then I have a very easy breathing. So then from these points, my view is are okay, actually, and very ultimately, outsmart the China as well as the United States. Are okay, acting very sophisticatedly and expectably. So then, that's why I see there's no way China could just, uh, how say, spill over some sort of the Chinese dissatisfaction to the uh, uh, U.S. Are okay alliance. On the other hand. I think, yes, there's a now a lot, lot of uh, uh, criticism to the uh, Chinese foreign policy and the Xi Jinping administration. But I don't think the ongoing the strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China is some sort of, we say, uh, com com competition for either U.S. primacy or China primacy. My attribution to the Xi's foreign policy uh, disarray or some sort of fallout is strategic imprudence. There's no way I think that China could compete with US for the regional primacy. I think if anyone sees that way, I think it's really, really unrealistically, um, we say overestimate the China's strategic potential or strategic intentions. But the problem is, as the dot also very powerfully mentioned in your presentation in the morning session, uh, China now is in a very awful transition. My generation always believed the leading challenge for my country um, is what, what would, would be some sort of how fast or how slow the democratization could be. But we couldn't believe in the past five and six years, China's domestic politics is really very awfully backing down. But that kind of a thing is some sort of a new demonstration of Beijing completely changed you know, the strategic trajectory, my conclusion is no. 
So then don't overestimate the China's strategic intention. Such a, a, a rivalry, if it will be continue going further, it will be reckless imposition from the United States. My case, recent days I've become a celebrity in international media. It's very dismissing to me. And the problem is, to my understanding, American's national security mission now is crunching vis-a-vis -vis China. So they pose a lot of uh, limitation and constraint to the Chinese academia. It's very awful. And the problem is, that's the United States. If we expose the new Cold War to China, there's any way China could retreat? China could just uh, concede? Maybe not. But the problem is how the Japan ROK will dance with the US in launching the new Cold War vis-a-vis -vis China. That will be a big question mark. So then another point gave me feel confident about the feasibility of the US ROK alliance is this. I don't think the ROK will be forced to choose the side. But if any big power, just like the US, China, just uh, uncautiously or unsmartly just to move some way, then probably that kind of impact will be just the house say, simmering to get the soil reconsidered. So then my view is this. The China should know where the line is. Don't just uh, force the uh, uh, ROK to choose the side. Don't just the house say, uh, coerce the ROK to do something it is unwilling to do. If the China could always stay in that kind of a position, there's no big anxiety. Also, we'll overwhelm the Chinese, some sort of such a comfortable feeling to uh, ROK and the US uh, 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 allies. Uh, last point I want to mention is this. Um, ROK is not just our smart, the both powers. ROK is also presents a great you know, the creator of the uh, middle power uh, proactive activism in the region. So then, that's why I think it's not the art science, to even in Tyler Sower is a vibrant, intellectual vibrant place. Then I see the ROK could play a very positive contribution to help, you know, just the, uh, uh, we say, on the cutting some sort of a growing hostilities. For example, the SADA issue, uh, once eminently become the China's strategic anxiety. But I don't think the SAD uh, disputes well just uh, killing the China ROK relations. Now, the SADA issue is not a completely uh, just resolved, but at least the SADA issue is cooling down on both sides. From the Chinese perspective, any forceful reaction vis-a-vis -vis the SAD deployment probably will cause a lot of unproductive, we say, backlash. But on the uh, Korean side, I also see the uh, SAD issue probably is some sort of costly enterprise the DPRK, the ROK needed to deal with. So then after the post-SAD frictions, China ROK relations, I see some sort of a positive uh, um, we say the, the, the outcome is the strategic, we say seriousness on either side now is rising. So get to my conclusion. Um, Briefly, please. Of course, yeah, China's uh, strategic anxiety to the airlines will be always, always there. But unless the DPR, ROK would like to allow the American uh, strategic, we say deterrence, uh, deployment in the uh, Korean pinner, Peninsula, there is no way China's such an anxiety will be overwhelmed, some sort of a good feeling to uh, two countries. Then last one is, I also have to say, uh, yes, there is some sort of U.S. and Koreans, you know, anxiety about the futures, the China's intention to disband the ROK U.S. allies. But I have to say, it's beyond the China's capacity. I don't think we could leverage on disbanding of our lines. If we do that, that would be very undermining to the China's interest. Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, I think we have about 35 minutes, is that correct? Um, I'm going to ask for a set of questions and then open up the floor uh, for questions. Just a quick comment, since my American colleagues were so optimistic on the alliance, um, just to quickly comment on that. Uh, I think there's no, uh, Mark said, you know, there is daily contact between US government and South Korean government. Sid also said very close coordination. Um, I don't think there is any concern about that. I think when there, you know, when we're talking about risk to alliance coming out of Washington, let's just face it, we're talking about President Trump, right? We're talking about his, the very transactional uh, approach and his protectionist policies and the con continual questioning of the value of the alliance and questioning of the, you know, the sort of military force presence in South Korea. So that's sort of the risk. And coming out of Singapore, President Trump did announce you know, the cancel, cancel the joint exercises, and that was not coordinated with Seoul. So, you know, just differentiating the U.S. government, there's U.S. government, and there's President Trump. Um, <coughs> question, I, I want to start with Professor Kim. Um, <coughs> he said, you know, South, the South Korea is not spending a lot of time on its relationship with China and Japan. So I want to get to that China question, and maybe Professor Zofan can also um, talk about this. So we talked a lot about China in the morning, but even as U.S.-China uh, trade talks are ongoing to really avert a tariff escalation, there's no question that the Trump administration is really pursuing a multi-pronged um, strategy to constrain China, constrain uh, Chinese technological advancement. And I think this effort has bipartisan uh, congressional support and backing. And given that this has congressional backing, bipartisan backing on this, and even among national security types, um, there's a sense that this tension or rivalry, as uh, Sam, uh, Jim said this morning, that this rivalry is going to, or expected to continue beyond the Trump administration and beyond, uh, regardless of the who, what happens with the 2020 U.S. election. So in this scenario, I mean, can we talk about some of the South Korea's options? Jim Steinberg laid out four options that the South Korea has, you know, all eggs on U.S. basket, bandwagoning with China, staying neutral. He talked about how difficult that is. Um, can we talk about realistically what South Korea can really do uh, and what the options are on that? And with Professor Zofang, you, you said, you followed your presentation, how, do, how would you comment on Jim Steinberg's comment this morning on if South Korea needs to send a message to China, a clear red line, um, that China cannot be allowed to coerce or intimidate its neighbors, how would China respond to that? Could you start? That is an extremely hard question <laughs> to answer in a couple of uh, you know, sentences. But uh, as you might agree, uh, the U.S.-China uh, trade dispute is not an uh, you know, economic thing, uh, which means uh, it is really comprehensive kind of a dispute, which includes uh, uh, you know, pretty uh, you know, large amount of uh, strategic competition. Uh, that means uh, the U.S.-China kind of uh, you know, the rivalry includes uh, uh, two dimensions. If I oversimplify the economic dimension and the strategic dimension, I think on the economic front, uh, South Korea, uh, you know, had better kind of uh, maintain a somewhat, you know, neutral position because China, it, it, China is, uh, is our number one trading partner and the United States is uh, uh, number two. Uh, which means uh, the South Korea needs to be very pragmatic. But on the strategic front, I think uh, as an ally of the United States, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the South Korea uh, needs to, to, to support the basic, you know, the principles and vision of its uh, the, the policy toward the region. But that doesn't necessarily mean uh, we uh, need to cooperate with the United States uh, for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, supporting so-called, uh, you know, anti-China kind of an encirclement strategy. So uh, that is, if it, if it is not the case, I think, uh, you know, there are ample reason for South Korea to continue to maintain, uh, you know, genuine kind of a strategic cooperation with the United States uh, for the same, you know, for the time being, you know, for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Professor Zufang, did you? Yeah, I don't know what kind of the red line the uh, Korean friends will be drawn in front of China. So then I found, uh, yes, the both countries one of the, some sort of worrisome uh, potential source of the future instability 
of a bilateral relation is some sort of rampancy of the nationalistic sentiments. But I think the sense is also just a dropping. Then we were looking back the past five years, 25 years, what kind of a sense is a real irritator to our bilateral relations. So first is at the end of it's 1999, it's a galaxy incident. Then, well, uh, we say it's a uh, uh, Gogorio, you know, the, 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 the disputes. All such a things, in my view, is very stupidly, very uh, inflammatory. So now I think the Beijing got to be more cautious. So we don't want to overplay some sort of a, such a nationalistic, you know, the sentiments. So then, uh, besides this, I don't see there will be any red lines. Well, okay, France will be just, uh, how to say, very, very forcefully joining in front of China. So then all the things could be negotiable. I think it will be a very important formula for two, uh, let's say, geopolitically and geoeconomically geoeconomically highly integrated the, the neighbor countries. Uh, Mark, uh, Professor um, Yoshida talked about Japan-South Korea relationship. I wonder if you can comment on how South Korea-Japan relationship fits in the overall U.S. Rock Alliance. This, um, obviously, South Korea-Japan relationship is one of the most troubled relationship among the mature liberal democracies. Um, and from Washington's perspective, this continued poor relationship um, really jeopardized, I would think, the U.S. interests um, in, in just having a trilateral cooperation on the dealing with North Korea, um, hampering our ability to effectively uh, deal with China, and so on. Right, so when I was a younger diplomat, two words of advice I got. One was don't answer hypothetical questions, and the other is don't comment on Japan are okay relations. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I appreciated what Soya Putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, I appreciated what Soya yeah. they said, just, uh, said about uh, the role that uh, U.S. forces in Japan mm -hmm. uh, plays in the defense of Korea. I was actually at Okinawa yesterday uh, visiting some of our facilities there. I was at Camp Schwab. And very clear, these Marines, 4,000 or so Marines at Camp Schwab, know exactly what their duties are. Uh, of course, it's for the defense of Japan, but it's, they also understand very clearly it's for the defense of the Republic of Korea. And the forces we could bring to bear from Okinawa, thanks to the support of the Japanese government, not just on that island, but throughout Japan, really is, is critical to the ability of the United States to honor its treaty commitments to, to our South Korean allies. Now, uh, clearly, uh, the United States wishes for a constructive, productive relationship between Japan and the ROK. Uh, at the same time, we recognize there are very sensitive, very delicate historic issues, uh, historical issues um, that we hope both countries can address in a way uh, that paves uh, the road to a brighter future, a more uh, constructive future for both countries. But um, this is something for, for Japan and the ROK to work out. Now, what can the U.S. do? The U.S., we can continue to play when and where we can a convening role, a role in which we bring our three countries together to exercise together, to train together, to sit down and, and talk about and hash out some of the pressing issues uh, we all share and we all see as, as urgent for our own national security needs, whether it's North Korea, the, the obvious one. Uh, but we're also looking, you know, we also look for other ways uh, to sit down trilaterally and, and, and talk about the issues of the day, uh, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's uh, Southeast Asia, et cetera. But, um, you know, we will continue to play this role, bringing our three countries together because it's in our interest to do so. This isn't a high school in which we want our friends to get along because it's the thing to do. This is in our national interest to ensure that our three countries work well together, and by extension, Japan and the ROK work well together. Sid, I, I was going to ask you about wartime operational control uh, trans transition and the necessary readiness requirements. Um, what's your take on those that voice concern that OPCON transfer, when that actually takes place, that North Korea might interpret this transfer as weakening of the alliance uh, deterrence. Um, and, and, and also, I think some, some folks, some experts are also show, uh, expressing concern that turning over control would lead to U.S. reducing overall commitment on South Korea's security. I mean, they're just, it might not be true, but you know, those are, there are people who are with <coughs> concern. 
Sure, if you look at the history of this issue, I mean, this has been, if you think about the very early days when it was uh, discussed under the uh, Noam Hunt administration uh, back in, in 2006, and the, the conceptions that were had for uh, the, re the remaining U.S. force presence, how it would relate to the ROK, how command and control would work out, uh, and how that evolved to a more robust deepening of the Combined Forces Command itself, so that you, one would imagine that, you know, as, as part of conditions-based OPCON transfer, ROK capabilities are improving in key areas such as, you know, missile defense, uh, command and control, intelligence, uh, and, and then we would get to the point where we would, through verifying the conditions being fulfilled, say that the Republic of Korea now is prepared to assume wartime operation, operational control, and that the, the, command, the Combined Forces Command structure would look very much like it does today with two four, four stars swapping positions. You know, and you would still have uh, Commander, Combined Forces Command reporting through the Military com Commission the, the chairman of the ROC chief, chiefs of staff and the chairman of the U.S. chiefs of staff, minister of defense, secretary of defense, president of Republic of Korea, president of the United States. So at the end of the day, there's not much different uh, in, in terms other than the ROK now has all these additional capabilities and now is, has this, com this command and control in wartime, which when you look at the way we are positioned actually today, uh, for contingency. This is a war that will be fought by the Republic of Koreans primarily with the unique, strong, you know, uh, advanced capabilities that we bring to the fight. So I, I think as a properly executed, there is no erosion of deterrence. Uh, there is no sense of the U.S. walking away from the peninsula. There is no sense in a deterioration of capabilities. There's no sense that, uh, you know, much is different today. I work in the, uh, the C2, uh, so in the, the military structure, two is intelligence. And in the C2, we already have the C2 being a ROK two-star general with a U.S. one-star general uh, working under him. So we already have, uh, you know, organizational construct within CFC that really positions us well, and, and I don't see in any way uh, deterrence being, North Korea being encouraged in any way. And if they are, shame on them, they'll find out soon enough. Do we have a target date? Hmm? Do we have a target date? Well, right now, the, the process is one of conditions based, and this goes back to the last time, uh, back I think it was the 2014 time period, uh, when, we, when we agreed upon the most recent delay and it was at that time decided it would be based upon a number of conditions that uh, includes acquisitions, training, capabilities, <coughs> improving those capabilities uh, during exercises, et cetera. So uh, President Moon has gone on the record of wanting to accelerate this so that he achieves it during his term. Uh, that in no way impacts uh, the fact that this is a conditions-based OPCON transfer. So my last question is to Professor um, Yoshide on North Korea, and I, anybody else can chime in. Um, you said Kim is serious, um, s but serious about what? Are, are you meaning denuclearization? I, I wanted to just follow up on that. Um, you said also we should have a phased process. Um, what, one thing we learned from Hanoi is that he wants sanctions relief, right? We are ready to give, US was ready to give a peace declaration. And, and some other goodies like opening laser offices, I think. But it was very, very clear what Kim wanted was sanctions relief. And this is why we are at an impasse now, because I don't think that's where we are. So uh, how do we get to this phase process? So first, what do you mean by Kim is serious? That is he really willing to uh, denuclearize? And then where is this phase of process when, when we're stuck at this point um, to Pyongyang and Washington? Well, maybe I, I kind of regret I raised this point. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to put into 
this, this situation <laughs> because, as I said, I really don't know uh, the answers to my questions. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, right now, I think we are almost leaving everything to Trump and Kim Jong. <coughs> and in this negotiation uh, toward Hanoi, Mr. Kim Jong was somehow came to believe that this might work. So I don't know why he came to that judgment. So I think that's, 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 that's a function of what's been going on between US and North Korea, I think. And uh, the point that I wanted to make was there should be coordinated sort of uh, you know, approach among ourselves, ourselves being mostly US, South Korea, and, and Japan, and maybe some others. And leaving everything to in, in the hands of Mr. Trump could be very tricky, I think. But, uh, but I don't know if U.S. would listen to, to this. And, but nature of seriousness, uh, again, I, 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 re I, just, I just guess, but as many people talk about, I think he may be serious about, of course, uh, keeping his, maintaining his leadership for many years to come. But in order for him to do this, he has to improve the kind living standard of the people. I think he has to do something about North Korean economy. And they used to talk about Pyongyang, I mean, nuclear development and economic development. And when they declared the victory of Pyongyang policy, I think that was a strategic announcement that they're going to put emphasis upon economic side. I think uh, as to this decision, I, I think Mr. Kim Jong is serious. And he, he hasn't backed off from this kind of you know, original decision of himself. <clears throat> and so he's, I think, s still struggling through this process. And so we have to be equally somewhat, I mean, in a way strategic in responding to this North Korea. So I, I'm sorry, I can just say only those general things. Russell specific. Kim yeah. has <coughs> two yeah. finger. Yeah, just a two finger uh, intervention. I think uh, Kim Jong-un is, is uh, serious, uh, serious about denuclearization but uh, more importantly, uh, you know, he's uh, serious about uh, denuclearization with big uh, conditions. Uh, we should be reminded of the, the, the fact that uh, the South Korea's envoy to North Korea uh, last year uh, debriefed about uh, what they, they were discussed, uh, discussing with Kim Jong-un and uh, they delivered the message of Kim Jong-un. That is uh, what you know, we remember correctly. Uh, that is. Uh, uh, North Korea is ready to give up its nuclear weapons if uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. as well as other uh, international community members eliminate so-called uh, the, the threat, uh, the security threat to North Korea. But that is a big condition, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Uh, still, I think... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just want to yeah, intervene, sorry. Uh, but I, I, I was not talking about denuclearization as an issue of Kim, uh, regarding Kim Jong being serious or not. I, I don't know whether he's serious about mm -hmm. denuclearization per se. This is a card, I think, yeah. for him. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, and about his project, project. you know, new project. <laughs> See, that's yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I must say, uh, since I clearly am not going to make a policy comment here, <laughs> as an intelligence analyst, this is an exciting time because no time than ever before have we had such clarity on measuring Kim Jong-un's sincerity. In seriousness, he keeps throwing Young Byun at us. Young Byun for sanctions relief. That's what Jim Kelly. I mean, it, this issue hasn't changed for years, uh, and I think this is the, the the positive outcome of Hanoi is that the president was able to make clear this is what you get, this is the package, and this is what we want, and and the ball's in Kim's court. So uh, I I really stopped worrying about intent. Uh, a while ago, because I think we will be able to judge North Korea by its actions, not by its words. Uh, you know, you mentioned that we, you don't want to leave it to President Trump necessarily in North Korea. The problem is that Kim Jong-un continually wants to just deal with President Trump, right? Um, I think Began might have just reached out to Choi Soon-yi, but there's no response from North Korea. They are the ones who want to just continually deal with Trump, so that's kind of the problem. Okay, I'm going to ask if there are questions, please raise your hands. Go ahead, in the back, the third row. I'll take both of your questions. Thank you. 
Can you identify yourself, please? Hello. Okay. Uh, this is a question for prof this is a question for Professor Zhu Feng. Um, in two years, the China DPRK Mutual Defense Treaty is set to automatically renew. I'm curious, what, what do you think in 2019, what's the biggest value that this treaty gives Beijing at this time? Thank you. Go ahead. You had a question. Yep. Can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is a, a question to Mr. Saylor. I, I, I'm from Japan. My name is Yoichi Kato from Japan, and I am really stunned by what you said about the status of deterrence. You said no erosion of de deterrence, but uh, there is a serious concern expressed in Japan's defense community because if you don't exercise, your readiness goes down. And uh, the replacement of key result by Don Muan and cancellation of Fall Eagle, that's a, that's a tangible decrease of exercise. And if you say that the uh, deterrence decreased to some extent, but it's still strong enough, I can understand. But if you say there is no erosion deterrence, I don't buy it. And that will really decrease the credibility of US alliance uh, with Japan. And uh, I understand uh, there is a necessity for make that kind of statement, maybe this kind of setting. But uh, if you think seriously otherwise, I hope you indicate. OK, thank you. Go ahead, Gil. My question is for Ju Fung. Uh, and I'm wondering if you think there's any discussion in South Korea or China of how the two can cooperate more in dealing with North Korea if um, certain contingencies develop, if there's a stalemate here and there's no real progress and both sides really want some progress, are, do either side, does either think that they can use the other to get more pressure on the United States. South Korea and China? South Korea and China yeah, okay. potential to cooperate. OK, so Professor Fung, you have two questions. China DPRK Defense Treaty, the value of it, and what Gil just asked. OK, so uh, great question. Thanks. First of all, um, I think the defense treaty between Pyongyang and Beijing um, appear more symbolic than uh, substantive. The reason is, um, security arrangement between Beijing and Pyongyang going horror and horror uh, does not just uh, how say follow up like any uh, real uh, guidance from this treaty. So then I think the treaty is just uh, some sort of uh, with a carrot dangling before the two countries. Of course, it still serves some sort of the strategic ambiguity in terms of Unresolved, you know, the peace region uh, build up in the Korean Peninsula. But besides this, then uh, this treaty is truly just a going um, with a unsubstantive. The reason is, if you look through the Chinese media coverage, no one mentions this. For most of the Chinese, the North Korea is China's treaty alliance. I can tell you, I did a lot of a survey. Nearly 85% of the Chinese respondent, respondents don't know what's a real existing between Beijing and Pyongyang. And even some sort of uh, the China's, uh, Chinese people's prefer preferred you know, the choice over a treaty online is Islamabad rather than Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. So then it's a very telling evidence, as I mentioned, just uh, besides some sort of um, we say uh, quite a, a, a incomplete strategic ambiguity, probably in the futures, you know, of, uh, legality in some sort of emergency response. I see that defense treaty is totally gone. Uh, second question is um, China um, ROK cooperates over the DPRK. Yeah, if we're looking back the past 15 years, every time six party talk could produce some sort of positive bearing. On Rislu, Beijing, Seoul Corporation. Back to the 2006 and 2007, I think all the six party talks reached the agreements on two disablements, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the arrangement. 
It's just us through Beijing, our case, very, very intimate cooperation. But today, yes, I see such a China RK cooperation is ratcheting down. The reason is multiple. First is um, sad friction and it's some sort of crippling effects. And it's truly, it seemed to me, it's undermined the mutual trust. Then second, I also see uh, some sort of uh, Min Jae-in government is very, very confident through the uh, source, some sort of uh, individual endeavor, then the Pyongyang could be gradually uh, breached, not just economically, politically, but also some sort of strategically. So that's why I see secondary reason is Moon Jae-in governments, not just intentionally overlook the China factor, but it's, it's confidence just a definite lead to uh, so dominated some sort of such a, uh, we say, uh, moderation. So then China's brush aside. Last month, I published my OPED at Dong Aibo. I truly calling on re-examining China factor in the months, you know, the DPRK handling methodology. So I totally believe Yes, so far the Trump administration also similarly brushed aside the China factor. But my hunch is this, without the China's proactive engagement, there's no way DPRK issue could be solidly settled. So then, um, current test for Seoul and Beijing is in one way, such a critical new dynamic could rebuild to pull both sides very seriously on DPRK project. Okay. I'm a very curious. Thank you. Sid, um, erosion of deterrence, how can you say no erosion of deterrence when there's no military exercises? Well, you know, deterrence is a complex subject uh, and uh, even the greatest experts at it uh, always find, you know, the, the, the bottom line, which is we know deterrence works until it doesn't, right? Uh, but, you know, I, I think at, at a certain level we need to, to, to distinguish between deterrence and readiness, right? Because deterrence has multiple compo commi uh, components. It speaks of our commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea as articulated both in written tr you know, treaties as well as our day-to-day -day comments on the alliance. It has to do with the capabilities we deploy to the peninsula, everything from THAAD to, to Patriot Missile Defense Systems to uh, a whole range of systems that we would bring to the peninsula in time of conflict. Uh, it does have to do with the readiness, the ability of our, our 28,500 troops to, to train at multiple levels, whether it's a, it's a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine doing basic rifle proficiency, to general officers sitting around and examining operational plans and decision-making processes. It's a, it's a very complex thing, this deterrence. And then we, it's often mis, uh, intertwined with assurance. When you think about the times we would fly strategic bomber missions, uh, in 2013 immediately comes to mind. You have the, the third nuclear test, a, a lot of uh, chest thumping by North Korea, and, and we, we deployed a number of strategic bombers at the time, in part to give assurance to the people of the Republic of Korea and our allies in the region, even Japan, that whatever North Korea was doing on its WMD program, we had the capabilities to counter it. And in that regard, uh, it would be wrong for me to say that not holding a, 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 a complex exercise like when we uh, stood down UFG uh, didn't have an impact on capabilities and readiness because we're constantly rotating people and as people rotate they need to be trained you have US officers rotating every year you have Korean officers moving in and out of positions uh, but but what's not visible behind the publicly announced exercises the so-called named exercises is the day-to-day -day battle rhythm we have working side by side in the real world looking at the threat posed by North Korea looking at our, our operational plans, refining those plans, refining our processes, tabletop exercises, 
there's so much that isn't visible, I can tell you both in terms of capabilities and in terms of demonstrated deterrence, that there's been no erosion of our deterrence of North Korea that has come from uh, you know, the exercise cancellations, as far as I can honestly say from my But my I mean, how many years? Can, can we just go on like this without exercises? There is a good question. <clears throat> I mean, you could ask theoretically, it, does North Korea say it's, it cl think it's claimed a victory by getting us from walking away of a key part of our commitment? And, and I think that would be a gross misjudgment on North Korea's part, because we're still here. We still have the best Army, our Air Force, Air, you know, Navy, Marine Corps in the world. We still have capabilities that are committed to the peninsula. That hasn't changed. Okay, we have time for just very quick questions. No comments, questions. Please, those two ladies right there in the middle. And the two ladies, I'll take both of their questions. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I'm Yu Jung Lee of Chungang Ilbo, and I want to ask uh, Sir Mark Nepper. <laughs> I think it a uh, it little bit, it could be a little bit tough question for you. And uh, as you know, uh, there was the uh, U.S. and ROK summit meeting in Washington uh, several weeks ago, and I think it, it reveals um, fundamental difference uh, between U.S. and ROK about the uh, uh, approachment of the uh, toward the DPRK issue, and uh, uh, the South Korea wants uh, step by What's step. What's the question, please? <laughs> I don't have a lot okay. of time. I have two minutes. Approach, uh, approachment and U.S. Uh, need um, big deal, and uh, it's a little bit tough question for you, I think. It's but okay. Uh, Ask the question, yeah. please. <laughs> How can you narrow it? Uh, the point. Well, I, uh, to be honest, I don't. I think I agree with the fundamental premise of your question that uh, the, the moon visit somehow revealed a huge chasm between our two governments. In fact, I think we were able to confirm with this meeting so soon after Hanoi uh, about the, the need essentially for, for fully final verified denuclearization before we can give uh, sanctions lifting, sanctions easing to North Korea. And that point was made very clear in the conversation between our two leaders. I promise that. That yeah, I'll take that one last question. Hi, uh, my name is Darcy Drought. I'm a PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins and a visiting scholar at Yonsei University here. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Han and Mr. Knapper. Uh, I recently read in Asan's report of, that the public perception of the U.S. or ARC alliance dropped to 68%, which is a little bit of a dip from the recent years, which has reached nearly the 80th percentile. So I wonder, from your perspectives uh, in Seoul and in, in DC, um, is, it, is this something that bodes poorly for the, the alliance? Is this something that needs to be managed on both sides? Or is this just a dip uh, to be expected uh, in, in the current uh, climate? I don't know. I mean, I've seen Pew, uh, Pew surveys that are still have us up at about 81%. So I don't know if it's a, a rounding error <coughs> or a, a question of methodology. But um, no, I think, uh, I think the relations remain very strong. I think a lot of other surveys bear that out. Um, these things do kind of go up and down. Uh, it's a very similar U.S.-Japan relationship as well. So I don't, uh, I don't think we're too, uh, too exercised by, uh, by the fact that we've got a, a results from that survey like that. Even, even in 2002 and 2003, when we had a uh, really uh, agonizing kind of a time of uh, rising uh, anti-American uh, sentiment, uh, Gallup conducted a poll at the time, and uh, surprisingly, uh, more than 50% of the South Korean people uh, recognize uh, the need for the alliance. So I think uh, you, you can take it into consideration. <laughs> so on that note, please uh, join me in thanking this panel for excellent discussion. Thank you. Thank you.